27,000 people lost their jobs. And that's just not right. That should never be allowed to happen. And somebody asked me the question, do you regret saying what you said in 1991 at the Albert Hall? And I said, well, that is clearly the stupidest question anybody's ever asked me. Of course I regret I lost everything. So clearly somebody that night had it in for you. You probably have an idea who it is. So today we've got a great guest, we've got my good friend Gerald Ratner, who owned the famous chain of jewellery stores around the world, the Ratners. Now he has an incredible story, probably more incredible than what my backstory is. And I have to keep giving interviews all the time, which I enjoy because people learn from my bad times I had and the good times I've had and continue to have and the interesting parts of my story. And, and if it just changes one life, then it makes all the difference. And I know Gerald has the same opinion because he's told this story over and over and over and over and over again. It's been 30 years now since the incident that happened. And um, a lot of you remember his, his chain that he had there and his huge success, a multi-billion brand. Um, in fact, one of my franchisees, when I mentioned yesterday I was going to be interviewing Gerald, he was all gold excited because he's from Swindon, he's my biggest franchisee, Pat O'Driscoll, and he said at Christmas, on Christmas Eve, he'd always go round and run to Ratners at the last minute and pretty much get everything he needs to do for all his family for Christmas, and that was a yearly event, so he was deeply sad to see Ratners go down. So we're going to get into what happened. A lot of you know what happened, but the real truth of what happened, obviously a lot of this has got to do with the media, which I've had majority of my life, been different stories I wake up to and think, what the heck is this? mainly because of my relationship with some superstars and friendships with them and my own success where I've been picked on by the media, then praised and bigged up and they try and push you down again. And Gerald is probably one of the most, um, the, the worst cases that I've ever seen of such a ridiculous way to bring someone down. And this is when the media was powerful, I must add. This is when the media, were, you're talking where a newspaper would get millions of reach per day. Not like it is now, where you hardly know you're in it when you get in the newspaper. So, so welcome, Gerald, to the show. How are you, sir? I'm very well, and thank you very much, Matt, for inviting me to your podcast. And I know you've done these interviews a million times before, but can we can we dig into your early age background first? So did you have any business training? What was it like at school, your background? I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a myth out there that you were born into money. I know the truth to all these answers, obviously being a friend of our mutual friend, Rob Moore. But could you give us a bit of background of how it first came about and how you had Ratners in your hands? Well, yeah, it was a family business. Um, and I used to uh, go around with the sh to the shops with my father when he just had six shops. And it was sort of in my blood. And I was reading about you and saying that you don't really get much training at school about the important things like making money in business and stuff like that. Um, so I really didn't learn anything at school and um, was basically expelled from my grammar school um, for coming last in class. But I did learn um, going to Petticoat Lane, uh, which was a market still going in the East End of London, uh, where I learned very simple rule that the people that were selling successfully were the ones that were shouting the loudest. I know that some people like to be um, very sophisticated and understated, but in retail, uh, you've got to shoot from shout from the rooftops. And and they had the crowd, the people that he was selling. This guy was selling china plates and cups and stuff like that, and he was juggling them and he was making jokes and he was shouting and he got a huge crowd of people. And of course, he gets his friend to buy the first one, which you always need to do. He had all the tricks in the trade. And it's no different uh, when you're running two and a half thousand shops like I did. Uh, you have to come up with, a, you know, new tricks. You do have to be, you know, you have to shout uh, that otherwise, no, you know, there's so much competition, nobody will know you were there. Um, so I learned um, basically um, about, the tr about selling. Um, not at school, but wandering around markets. And, um, yeah, so when I left, I left without any education at the age of 15 and, walk, uh, uh, you know, started working in my father's shop, um, which is the best education you can have. 
Um, you see people in retail today who have never been near the shops. They've never been near the customers. They're accountants or whatever, and they don't understand what it's about. It's important to have, you know, I was talking to a guy who owns a restaurant the other day, and he said he'd rather have somebody who started at the bottom, who put the dustbins out at two o'clock in the morning, than some graduate who walks in uh, with a load of qualifications, because you have to know your trade. And I, I believe, you know, working in the shop at a young age, um, I'm going through the business, and I, I learned the trade, um, and I was pretty useless to start with. But, you know, finally, at the age of 30, uh, I, I started learning and, and understanding where we should go uh, because the, my father's business, as you quite rightly say, we weren't rolling in it. He was really struggling, making a loss. Um, and that's when I took over and changed it and, and turned it into uh, the world's largest jewellery business with two and a half thousand shops. It's interesting how you have the same opinion as the school system as I do because... I can't put my finger on anything, Joe, that that I um, learned from school that that's helped me with my business career. I just don't. It was all self education for me. Reading three or four nonfiction books, who week, hanging around with the right people uh, who are a higher level than me, who I wanted to aspire to to become. I know you're a big believer in that because you mentor people and so on, don't don't you? To to achieve that success, but. A lot of it's mindset. Would you agree? Mindset, your drive, your determination um, to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, I've had graduates that come in uh, and they don't have the work ethic. I do believe that um, you have to have uh, really, you know, started at the bottom, as I said. And we, you know, once my uh, one of my colleagues said to me, we 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 need graduates. Uh, in the business for future management. Um, and he brought in graduates. I said, well, I don't mind that, but they've got to work in the shop for at least six months so they learn the ropes. And they did, and they took over those six shops, and they were the worst performing shops uh, that we had because they didn't have the work ethic, because they didn't feel that they needed to fight for everything. And that's why you see immigrants uh, doing so well and traditionally starting up so many businesses. Um, it isn't a matter of having education and swanning in there and putting your feet up and thinking that, you know, it's all going to come to you. Um, you. You have to know your trade and you have to do, I mean, I was doing sort of the gofing, running around. I was cleaning the toilets. I was doing, you know, the washing up and stuff like that. Uh, and it, it's it's all good. It's all good because, you you know, you then can look at the people that are working for you and look them in the face and say, well, you know, and they know you've done it. You've learned every area of the business. You're not just sitting there. And it's true. I don't look at CVs. I don't look at graduate. I don't respect any of that at all. Obviously, it's different if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist or an accountant. Yeah. That's the exceptions. Yeah. But, but for me, I, I look for attitudinal qualities. And like you, I answered the phone, cleaned the toilets, I did the hoovering, taught the classes, did the sales. So I knew every aspect. So when I brought people in, I knew why, how I had to replace myself. So from there on, you took over the business from your father. How the heck did it get to the crazy? What was it turning over at its, at its peak? 1.2 billion, was that right? Yeah, and we were making profits of 125 million pounds um, which is, you know, going back over 30 years ago, is, you know, like a few hundred million today. And there's not many retailers that were making that. And just going back to what you said about doctors, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, school is very, very important if you, have a, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. But in the, in the really raw world of retail and business, um, you know, that doesn't count for a lot. Um, you, you know, you, you have to have a certain amount of savvy. And I looked at that business uh, that my father was running, and it was very upmarket, as were all the jewellers with the chandeliers and the velvet pads. And the world had changed in the 80s. The demographics were such that it was the young people. I know it's not the same now. It's the older people who got the money, but it was the 16 to 24s who were suddenly spending a lot of money in the high streets. They were going into shops like Next and Dixon's and Topshop, but they weren't coming into the jewellers because they felt there was a threshold barrier. They couldn't afford to buy the products we were selling. And they were right because the jewellers were very expensive. 
So I wanted to tune in to, you know, impulse selling, which people said, well, jewellery isn't about that. So instead of selling expensive diamond rings, uh, we started putting in uh, earrings and um, chains and stuff like that. We're very fashionable and very low price, but still all gold. It was all real jewellery. And so when a, when a young girl was going out on Saturday afternoon looking for an outfit for that Saturday night, she could buy, you know, a gold bracelet or earrings for under a tenner uh, to go with her outfit. And that was – so we, we basically uh, adapted – uh, to the demographics, but along with um, along with changing that product to a much lower priced product, we, um, as I said when we went down to Petticoat Lane, we aggressively marketed. We shouted from the rooftops. We did things that the jewellers turned their noses up, which was basically paying pop music, putting posters up, fifty percent up, um, having sandwich boards, uh, very aggressive marketing. Uh, which, again, was something abhorrent to the jewellers. And, of course, it worked extremely well. Um, It enabled us to um, expand and um, eventually acquire our competitors, like H. Samuel, who were still in the old old world of trying to be prestigious, um, which didn't work. And um, when we then acquired H. Samuel, that was the real stage, the real platform, because they were much bigger than us. They had 450 stores. They had a phenomenal brand, incredible locations. And when we put that um, way of selling and that product and, and that marketing into H. Samuel, uh, it had phenomenal results. They were a public company. We turned their profits from $4 million to $60 million inside a year, because in retail, you can, uh, if you change things, you can get quick results. In any business you can. So what you've done there is exactly what I've done with the martial arts. So I've took martial arts out of the dark ages where people would do 10 press-ups to get kicked in the belly to punish them. No music on in the lessons. You know, don't smile at your students. Arms folded, very restrictive. And I made it music on in the lessons. And I made it a family brand. So it's affordable to the family. So they, if you've got one student, you pay one price and then it discounts down. So it's all affordable. But it was unaffordable before. I took it out of the dark age from 2,000 years ago because we have things called guns now and knives and teach people the best way to defend yourself. Obviously, you used to run away and to prevent. And I also put an education system in with it, life skills and stuff, give kids homework. And by doing that, yeah, I got a lot. They say the lead dog takes all the forms, and you certainly did, Gerald, in your industry. I did in mine. Everyone started attacking me. I was an aggressive marketer right from the beginning. And always trying to get in the media, always pushing, turn that to an opening of an envelope if I could, pushing my brand forward. The other martial arts schools, you can't do that. They they would do silly things like blogs. We didn't have Facebook and stuff back then, but we had blogs and MySpace. And, and they would write to local newspapers to try and block me because they just didn't believe that I could do what I was doing. Strangely enough, two years later, they were all copying me. And now it's like an industry standard. I made martial arts an industry. Everyone... It's, it's a proper career now. You can get, you can stay at school. You want to become a martial arts instructor, and, and no longer with your careers advisor, laugh at you. They laughed at me. They said, "Don't be silly, Matthew. Go and get uh, go and stand in that queue over there and become a vet or something else or electrician." And then I, she was wrong. Two years later, I went back to the school, greeted the career, careers advisor in my brand new Ferrari three five five, gave her a hug, and she couldn't believe her eyes. But if you go against the grain sometimes, it really does in business. you got to look at what the masses are doing and do the opposite. And you agree, and you have to be an aggressive marketer. You've got to be out there in people's faces. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And when your competitors start uh, hating you, then that is you must be doing something right. Uh, and when people laugh at you, um, you're doing something different from everybody else. And that is the key. Because if you do, if you're in an industry and you do exactly the same um, as everyone else, and which is basically what we were doing, selling watches at exactly the same price as our competitors, um, doing the similar sort of product, that there isn't in any industry um, enough to go around for everyone to do well. Um, you've got to have somebody who's disrupting it, um, and then you know they're going to take business from their competitors, just like Audi and Lidl are taking business from other competitors. Um, Because 
you, and, and that's what you did and, and that's what I did. Um, it's no good. One thing I have learned, it's no good doing what everybody else is doing. You know, even what you're doing might not work, but one thing for sure, if you do what everybody else does and you follow conventional wisdom uh, and you open up a restaurant and it's exactly the same as everybody else selling the same things, as him, you will not, one thing for sure, you will do badly. You will fall. So you have to be innovative in terms of having something which is cutting through the clutter, doing something different. Um, it you sometimes works, it doesn't. You've got to look at your competitor, study them, model them and find what they do and how can I do it better to appeal to the masses. I think that's the way to sum it up. Now, the haters thing is an interesting one because we're both friends with my, my best friend, his godfather to one of my daughters, Yuri Geller, who lived, lived just down the road for you until too recently. When I used to get hate in my early days, it used to bother me. Gerald, it used to bother me a lot. And I used to call him up and he would say, literally, I would say to him, oh, Yuri, I'm, I'm getting... So this person said this about me. This local paper said this about me. And he said, what's, what's your problem? The New York Times has just printed this about me. I've been controversial all my life. I made a lot of fortune out of it. He said, um, it's good to have haters. They're your free publicists. He said, I love you, Matt. Bye. Call me when you've got a real problem. Put the phone down on me. And that conversation had a real impact on me. And general people can buy likes and followers these days. If I could buy haters, I would, because they are out there you know, talking about you and um, my late friend, Michael Jackson, I used to, I, cause he used to get a tremendous amount of hate and co controversy and go to great lengths to become mysterious. And I used to say to Michael, doesn't it bother you? All these stories. He said, no, Matt, you've got to worry about it when they don't talk about you. Well, that, that has cheered me up. And that's a very interesting point, which actually gels with my experience because, okay, in normal circumstances, what I said 31 years ago would have been forgotten by now. But because of all these haters on Twitter and because of all the nasty things that are said about me in the press, it, everyone, you know, it still continued and people still know who I am, albeit for the wrong reasons. But when I go up and do a speech on a wet evening, on Tuesday evening in Wigan, uh, I walk into that hall and they all know who I am, which is actually... <laughs> A hell of a lot better, uh, which is a huge advantage, rather than walking into that hall and nobody knows who you are. So um, there's a lot of what you say. Uh, that there is truth in that. And that is what Michael Jackson and what you're talking about and Yuri Geller is basically not letting them win, uh, turning a huge negative into a positive. Uh, because if you're lying in the gutter, uh, somebody's going to kick you there. You've got to get up and you've got to, and, and you've got to use. I mean, when I opened up a health club in Henley, uh, near where I live, uh, the fact that uh, I was well known, albeit for the wrong reasons, meant that everyone in Henley knew that I was opening up that club because they did a whole television show about it and they put it in the papers. And it was, they were very critical. They were saying they were calling it, you know, it's going to be crap and all that. But every, the main thing was that everyone and then in the health club business, what you do need is people to be aware that you exist. Yeah, well, you're not going to get anywhere. No. you, you got to adapt with the times of podcast, social media. You've got to be at the forefront. So let's go. So you got you built it to 2,000 stores. Now, I've got franchises, which is slightly different. So I'm not responsible for their day-to-day -day management. We give them the systems and so on. Yours was a different business model. How the heck do you even comprehend and manage without being entrepreneurs, I believe, are the people who can really handle an awful lot of stress? So how much stress was Mr. Ratner yourself under back then with 2,000 stores, with all these acquisitions happening? Worrying, did you worry about what was going on in each one? I know you were very hands-on, from what I understand. You knew all your managers very well. Just like I know my franchises, and I know their children. I mean, I, I know them when they're ill. I know when they're on holiday. It's it's more of a family. It's not it's not a um, a, a very corporate feel. But how did you handle that kind of management? And are you someone that gets easily stressed? Not at all. In fact, I spent most days playing snooker with my friends Charles Sarchi and uh, Michael Green um, because of the fact that I'd set up the business to run itself. And I compared it to McDonald's because every single store was the same, whether it was in Exeter or Edinburgh. 
uh, I would arrive, and you're right, I would know the manager because that's very important for morale, um, turn up. But I would know that that particular diamond ring was in the exact same place before I even arrived there because we had a blueprint that everyone had to follow. So it was important that the diamond ring was displayed 42 inches from the ground because an average woman was five foot four and the trajectory of her eye would fall at 42 inches uh, where it would be displayed at its best possible way and catch the light. And, uh, but that was all done in a model shop in our head office. So basically I was running one shop and going in there, uh, making changes with my colleagues and buyers, uh, but then it was repeated right across the country, not in America. Uh, we had a blueprint there because we didn't make the mistake that everybody makes that thinks that um, you can go to uh, America and transport your formula, however successful it was, because the Americans might speak the same language, but uh, they're as different as they could ever be from us. And that's the first lesson. But yeah, um, I didn't, I had people used to say, how come you're running this world's largest two and a half thousand shops and you're, you know, you're always available to chat and you're not rushing around like a blue ass fly. People that I've met in business and everyone says, oh, you know, there's this stereotype that, you know, I'm successful because I get up at six o'clock in the morning and I bust my balls and I work really hard and that's it. A lot of people do that. They work really hard, but they don't make any money. Uh, it's the time, it's it's making the right decisions, the smart decisions. Uh, it's not about actually using up shoe leather. So you almost operate like a franchise model where you had your flagship shop and all people had to do, your managers, is duplicate that and then over and over and over again. And then you would spot check. And I take it going back there, because I get asked this a lot too, was there... At the height of your success, when you visit these managers, you're very personable with all the staff and managers. You didn't have an ego, as far as I was aware. You no, just, no. You down to earth, earth because I, I had been there where they were, and I've always been down to earth. And this is what is so upsetting about the way they portray me in the press about being this snob who is uh, making fun of their customers. Nothing can be further from the truth. But everything I read in the press, well, if I happen to have the facts about it, Nothing could be further from the truth. What they write about is complete diametrically opposite of what uh, actually is, is the truth of the matter. But, you know, that that's the press. I'm not criticising them because uh, if they did what, if they wrote everything out verbatim, nobody would be bothered to read the the, 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 the articles. They have to spice them up. But, being, yeah. being a media child is all about sex, drugs, rock and roll, scandal. I mean, that's... That's the way in. I mean, that's it. So they're never going to write something amazing about you, are they? And, it, and uh, it's a lesson, it's a hard lesson, hard pill to swallow that one because you're you're doing you good. You're treating everyone as a kind human being, and um, yeah, that don't get that don't make the news uh, no, no. at all. No, it doesn't. So from there onwards, there. So when you big chain is all going well, your lifestyle. So can we can we have a bit of an insight into your lifestyle? Oh, well, I uh, talking about multi. I had a plane. I had a plane in America uh, to get around the ship. We it quite. It sounds like a great luxury to have a Learjet and a Gulf Wing, uh, but in America, actually, it made a lot of sense uh, because of the fact, obviously, that you know it's, it's yeah. the quickest way to get around, as you would know. Uh, but the in the UK, I then bought a helicopter, which was a huge because I tried to replicate this thing of because it's very important to me to get around the shops and see people. But that didn't work at all because again, I, I should have learned that England is very Britain is very different from America, and uh, the idea of landing close to the shops uh, didn't work at all. There was all this red tape, and I had to land at airports, and it was a disaster. That helicopter. Uh, I had a house in London in Mayfair. Um, and then I had a house on the river in Bray uh, near the Fat Duck and the Waterside Inn um, and I had a I lived the life of Riley I had an incredible lifestyle um, which I, I lost be your friend, <laughs> imagine. sorry if everybody wanted to be your friend from celebrities to oh, yeah yeah, I was invited to 10 Downing Street, lunch with Margaret Thatcher. Um, 
Buckingham Palace, on the Royal Yacht, all that sort of stuff. But then, of course, when I made the speech and lost everything, uh, surprise, surprise, those invitations tended to dry up somewhat. So they always say you know who your friends are when you're down. I lost a lot of friends and family the night Michael Jackson died, Joe. Oh, right. Yeah. I know, well, you know, it's no point in getting upset about it. That is what people are like. It's more a reflection on them than it is on you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I've always been told, and I've learned from my own experience, that between anything above 10 million, 10 million now is about not the, the, what a million pound would represent 30 odd years ago. So once you've got 10 million or so, your lifestyle doesn't really, it's only so many planes you can buy, houses you can buy, and, and stuff like that. Anything above that, like to a ridiculous level you, you, you've got, you went to, is just insane. Your lifestyle don't really change that much. It becomes more of a game. To me, I just see it as a game. If I'm given a good service and, and given or product, then the money is the reward, the buy the buy um byproduct to your success. So I never really focused on the money initially. I just focused on providing educational classes, fantastic tuition, built it for families, and offering careers to people to turn their passion into their profession. So for you, were you motivated by that money, job, or did that just happen by you just giving an outstanding, one-of-a-kind service and products? I didn't need the money. I'm 100% the same as you. It wasn't an issue. I was once sitting in my house listening to the budget on the radio, and the Chancellor reduced the top rate of income tax, Nigel Lawson, from 60% to 40%, which meant I was earning 850000 a year basic salary, not that the salary was the big thing, it was my shares going up, but nevertheless, 850,000 was a few million in per year in salary, like the footballers are earning. And, you know, this tax cut was worth quite a few hundred thousand pounds to me. I couldn't give a shit. When he announced that, I didn't, I didn't say, oh, great, I'm going to be half a million pound a year better off because I couldn't care less. It's of no interest because you had enough money to do whatever you wanted. Um, you were more concerned about uh, getting market share, about being successful, about being better than your competitors. Uh, that was the real, that was the thing that really gave you pleasure, uh, building the business. Uh, the actual money side of it uh, was totally irrelevant, which is easy for me to say. Uh, because I had plenty of it. And when I lost it all, uh, I realised that the importance of money. I didn't realise the importance of money when I had all that money. <laughs> I only realised the importance of money when I lost it all. I did a TV show called Rich House Pour Out. We did two episodes, me and my family. And they put me from this mansion into a, a little council house, terraced house. And um, I thought I could handle it well. You don't realise what you've lost until it's gone. It's a very true saying. My kids were hearing noises through terrace houses because they've always lived in mansions. And I ran out of money by day three, <laughs> you know, far be the big shot. But it is a bit of a wake-up call. And I think it's a big lesson for all of us. You never know what's around the corner. Health-wise, all little slip-ups. Well, I don't believe it was a slip-up at all. I think that was more of an attack, which we'll get onto now. So with media, so how for people who listen here who've not had a media profile... It's all about the headline, especially now. It's about um, clickbait. So the headline will catch your attention. And then when you click on the headline, again, it goes into the real story, which sometimes has no real true representation to the headline at all. And, and sometimes the media will take risks with those headlines. So you could read something and think, oh, dear, what's happening here? Click on it. And the story really doesn't match up to the headlines. There's not much you can do about that. And they've got the editors of these newspapers are very, very clever at headline writing because – that's where they sell their advertising in their space. Now, back in Charles' era, obviously, I was very, very young back then, but I, I'm very aware of being involved in the, that type of media. It was still very heavy when 97, 98, when I was about 18, 19. If you were in the Sun newspaper or the Mirror, you knew about it. If you knew the news of the world, you certainly did know about it. And it wouldn't be for a good reason. It would be for a controversial headline and a story or they'll take a snippet. And this is something my famous friends have always had to deal with. And they used to, one of them wanted to, to have tabloid burning parties. He had enough of it. It was just too much to, to cope with. 
but at the same time, it also give puts you where you are, and it and it made like Mr. Ratner here. You go into a room, everyone knows who he is, and they remember that time, and they listen to him. And um, if it weren't for those headlines, he he wouldn't have had the, the success. Now, the interesting thing is, it all comes down to a speech, doesn't it? You gave, and you did this speech. I understand many times before it was very funny. I watched it last night, did my research. I wanted to watch the real one, not the the edited version you've got on YouTube. The whole thing, the whole context. If you watch it in its context, it's fine. You talk about one little item you require from H.K. Samuel, had a bit of dig at them. You praise the fact that you do you run a family brand and it's affordable. You're highly successful at the Royal Albert Hall. The ironic thing, too, is everyone was laughing at you it reminded me a bit of the Will Smith slap, to be honest, Joe, because when, when you see Will Smith before he goes up and slaps Chris Rock, he was laughing. And then something changed to make him go and go and slap him around the face and come back and shout a hurl of abuse. So clearly somebody that night had it in for you, clearly a journalist or a jealous competitor. You probably have an idea who it is. And um, you thought you'd done an incredible job, walked out of there, and then, bang, the headlines started to come in. So, so what happened that, that night? And it, am I right in saying you did this speech so many times before? It's like a standard cut paste speech, and you were just old to it for where you were. Well, the, the, the jokes that caused offence were already I'd made uh, like two or three years before, and it was reported in the Financial Times and the Sun, and they thought it was very funny. In fact, the Sun. Uh, put a little column, Gerald's Gems, with a list of the sort of jokes that he made, and it was all taken in the right way. But um, in 1991, there was a big recession going on. People couldn't pay their electricity bills, a bit like today. So the the agenda was to um, hit the fat cats. And so what, you're quite right in the terms of the speech. In fact, I said that we have achieved what we have done by selling quality products with um, quality staff. But we have one or two items that. Uh, surprise me that they sell because I don't, you know, I don't rate them particularly. Just like perhaps uh, somebody who's produced a lot of songs, records might say, I don't like that track, you know, it's not very good. Anyway, but if you'd have read the, pe and you're quite right in terms of the sun and the mirror, uh, the power that they had in those days, because the sun had 17 million circulation, today it has two and a half million because of the internet and the mirror as well. But if you read The Sun and the Mirror, it was a totally different, you wouldn't have, just like sometimes you go to a football match and you read the report and you think they've gone to a different match to me, because they said that I said that I love making fun of my customers, that all my jewellery is crap. I never even referred to my jewellery in that way. It was one item of Sherry Decanter. Um, that I have contempt for my customers uh, and then, of course, they put a picture of my house and my car and the boat and all that sort of stuff, uh, making fun of, you know, people. It was a totally disingenuous uh, piece in, in both papers on the front page. Uh, but, of course, that, that's what it is. That's what they do. And uh, it did huge damage because they were my customers, the, the sun readers and the mirror readers. And... Um, Unlike today in social, with social media, it took a while to filter through. So the sun kept doing, it wasn't just the day after the speech, it was every day. Uh, they did things like a picture of my house right across the front page. The headline was the house that crack built and stuff like that. So it was, a, it was an endless barrage of abuse. I became a tabloid punch bag. Uh, and that obviously uh, meant that nobody would come in our shops because who would buy jewellery from a shop where they sold crap. Not that I ever said we sold crap. And it's still reported to this day uh, that I said my products were crap. I never did. I said one. But there's no point in um, complaining about it. You know, I accept by implication that's the world we live in and I should have been more careful. Uh, and I paid a very, very high price for it. And, uh, yeah, and as you say, the uh, business went into loss. It was hugely successful. We were the most successful company on the stock exchange for two years running. I was retailer of the year. We were the only British retailer to crack America. Uh, we were sailing through that recession. We were on 200 million pound profit for the year that year. Uh, somebody once said, what could go wrong? 
um, and everything went wrong. And, uh, you know, we went into loss and uh, I hired a chairman to help me out and he fired me. Uh, and, I, you know, so it could not have been, apart from somebody dying, it could not have been a worse uh, your, situation. Your, well, your baby was dying. Your business was your baby, was your life. Exactly, exactly. It was my baby. That's exactly right. And, and I, I, I loved the fact that I turned it around from a very small family operation that was losing money to this hugely successful business. And, and it wasn't just me. It was so many people lost their jobs. Young men, uh, in those days, it was men that was running shops, and they were like 23, and uh, they said to me, Gerald, you gave me a chance, which I would never have had a chance of running a shop, and you gave me that chance, and, you know, and a lot of money. And that's the tragedy of, of it all, you know. So it wasn't only the guilt that I suffered and all the loss of the fact I was wiped out financially because the shares went from £4.20 to 2p. It was the fact that, uh, or, you know, I had 27,000 staff, which was actually more than the Royal Navy, and everyone suffered uh, because of the stupid joke. So it was a very difficult, it, it was a very difficult thing to swallow. People have setbacks in, in life. And is it true you lost half a billion over a course of two weeks? Yeah, that's right. In today's money, what's that going to be? Two, three billion, I'd imagine? Yeah. yeah. Over a joke about a sherry decanter. I've got to be honest, Joe, jo I'm amazed you're still here. <laughs> well, funny enough, I did go to see a psychiatrist because I'd had a nervous breakdown and uh, she gave me um, these pills, which was like a Prozac thing, uh, which actually, you know, made me less depressed, but just when I needed to get my, back on my feet and network, I was uh, in this shell because I was going out for dinner with people and I wasn't speaking. Uh, I couldn't network, I couldn't do anything. I was like a glump. So I'm not saying that Prozac or antidepressants isn't good for some people, but it wasn't good for me uh, at that time. So it was, and you will identify with this, Matt, that exercise uh, was the, the 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 key to to fighting the depression and the anxiety and all of all, all everything that's going wrong? And I know that in martial arts and stuff like that, it's phenomenal exercise. People don't realise they think it's running or swimming or something like that, but fighting is one of the best exercises for mental health uh, and for and, and it was. But in my case, I had a bad back, so I couldn't do that. I was doing cycling. Uh, and I still cycle to this day. I cycle 25 miles a day. And it is that. I know everyone says it's exercise is the key to it. But the reason everyone says it, because it is. And uh, that's what saved me and got me back on my feet. So to answer your question, you wonder why I'm still here. I'm still here because of uh, my road bike. Very similar to me, Joe Charles. So we, in 2009, everyone always said to me, Everything I touched went to gold. I've got a big property portfolio too, the biggest one in the Southwest, which I privately own. And they, a business part of mine said, one day something's going to go wrong. You can't keep going like this. In 2009, my mum calls me up and says, I've got six months to live. She was like my rock. Uh, of breast, she, died, she died of breast cancer in 2012. She passed away at 56 years young. And then on top of that, my wife, my first wife, I call her my rehearsal wife, she couldn't cope. She didn't sign up for this crazy lifestyle. She wanted someone just to watch Coronation Street with her each night in Emmerdale, you know, and uh, so that wasn't ever going to work out. So I went for a very aggressive divorce, which lasted four years with a lot of money involved, big barristers, and dead early ones really won, if I'm honest with you, and trying to cause friction between us. Then I had a family member who thought, Michael Jackson died that year as well. He was one of my closest friends. And then I had a family member who thought, hmm, my brother's done this. He doesn't seem to do a lot. Not really what, realizing what I do behind the scenes. I do do a lot. I'm driving the Ferraris around and all the rest of it. I'll have a crack at doing this myself. He took two of my franchises away. And my father as well went away to, to work. And for him, it didn't work out for him. Uh, and that kind of split the family. I mean, you find that a lot of success the family members, one goes off and it split the family up. So, yeah, in 2009, I found myself being prescribed. Um, I was on Prozac, which didn't, didn't work with me at all. And they gave me one called Sotralopram, which I took at night time. And they gave me Darzipam. 
I was like a walking zombie. And I was, I was staring at a computer screen. It was like this screen by this artificial, uh, invisible screen in front of me. And I went to my mum's funeral. And when he put the coffin in the ground, I, I was like 32 and stuff. It's the most traumatic event of my life. I couldn't even cry if I wanted to. And all that did for me, really, I couldn't train because these were all adrenaline blockers. They put me on a beta blocker called Propanol as well. So when I was, so weight training for me, when I have a good weight training session, I have a great business day. If I miss the weight training, it has an effect. And I'm a great believer, if you're not growing, you're dying, both mentally and physically. So I have to be building up the training, growing, growing my muscle cells or toning, pushing them forward, producing those natural endorphins and, and hormones we have in our body and keeping my stretching up. If I don't do that, my business really goes downhill. But my my wife, who I met in South Africa, she basically said it's either the pills or, or me. She flushed them all down the toilet. And um, I was like shaking for about two or three weeks. And it's not advisable for anyone to do that because you're not supposed to. You're supposed to wean yourself off them over a period of time. I was told there's a lot of happy fish in South Africa who are eating all these antidepressants, the stone down Valium. But yeah, the doctors don't handle it very well. I felt they... They don't know what to do with you, especially in your case, billionaire to, to zero. And in my case, where my late friends passed away, and everywhere I go, the music's playing. Everyone else that asks me about the situation, what happened, I will never get away from that. And what used to annoy me, when he died, I was always referred to Michael Jackson's almost bodyguard. But I was already a multi-millionaire my right for my own success. But that's gone. I had to learn to accept that. And I, I, met, I know Alvis Presley's bodyguard. Same happened to him. Uh, is that he's always wrote about as Alvis Presley bodyguard. Yeah, he's got a very successful martial artist. He's got his own name, but he's learned to live with it. And I had therapy and stuff, but I found out sometimes I, I was given the therapist cuddles because she didn't know what to do with me. It's such a bizarre situation. So I can completely relate to you on that one. Exercise yeah. the key. And something as simple as just going out in nature, walking for an hour. And I think the pandemic's changed a lot of people with this. I see a lot of people walking that I never did. Clears your mind, gets your focus. You talk to yourself, think about things, plan things, do it early in the morning, and then do your harder core exercise for your health later on in the afternoon. Um, and then your diet obviously is important. And if you don't put your health first, all the money in the world, I mean, health and wealth are very much connected. It's a complete waste of time. I think that's how you got through it, really, in a nutshell. Well, you could have you just talked about yourself. You could have just been talking about me. It's, it's exactly the same. Except when I, you said you were shaking when you went off the pills. I went in the bathroom when I went off the pills. It wasn't me that was shaking. It was the bathroom. I'm certain to this day that the whole bathroom was shaking. And but you, you've come through it. I've come through it. And you know, you meet people who have not had any setbacks in life, and I often think there's a lack of empathy a lack of sympathy with them. To be part of the human race, you have to have suffered. And you are a better man for it, and I'm a better man for it. I was very arrogant at the time when I was very successful. I've learned a lot of lessons. Yes, I'm not as rich as I was, but and the businesses that I run today are nothing like the size of my old business, but I appreciate them more. I don't want to get too cheesy, but I appreciate uh, the, when I go on holiday now, I don't have to go first class or anything like that or stay in the best hotels. I just love going away with the family because after I lost everything for seven years, I never went on holiday. I was just lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, which is the worst thing you can do is wallow in your own grief. And it was the exercise and you see people walking today uh, and the pandemic, there's always a silver lining. Pandemic is like the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. But, the thing that's good about it is that it's got people doing exercise, which is the most important thing. And incidentally, you don't get your best ideas when you're sitting in a boardroom and people are firing questions at you. You get your best ideas when you're completely unencumbered by that. You haven't got those pressures. You're walking, you're on your bike or you're swimming, whatever. Uh, that's when you solve the problems. When my People come to me and say, well, we've got this problem and everything like that. I said, well, I'm going to go for a walk. They said, why are you going for a walk? Yeah, we've got to solve this problem. I said, because that is how I solve it. And you you come back, you feel shit when you're sitting in that problem. You come back, you feel a different person. You feel great. I know it doesn't last forever. Uh, but you also, the problem that is facing you suddenly is solved. So I, when I was running a public company, 
never had time for any of that sort of stuff. You were in this goldfish bowl. You were under pressure the whole time. Uh, I now have a balance in life. You know, it's not about uh, making the you know huge amount of money. It's about being able to make enough money uh, to enjoy it. And believe you me, I'm not saying that money is not important because when I didn't have any money for those seven years, uh, I was and I had debts, uh, credit card bills, people banging at my door, friends looking at me as I was some sort of street accident. It was horrendous. It was really really horrendous and when i then went and because i saw the benefits of health and fitness i went into the health club business and sold a club in henley for four million pounds in uh 2001 uh, and i didn't have to pay any tax on it because i had so many losses uh it was a fantastic feeling so i was you know, a lot happier with money than I was with miserable as hell without it. I didn't need £10 million, as you say. No. Uh, but you do need enough uh, to be able to enjoy life uh, and spend it properly and not waste money on stupid things like helicopters. Yeah, yeah, that, that doesn't really work. You're right, in England, that doesn't work. You just can't land in the fields wherever you want to. You can have the police there before you know it. Um, just want to fire at you. So... That media attention you come under. So you've gone from the hero, people probably back then wanting pictures, the old fashioned way with normal cameras and stuff. I still remember those days. And then the media was so aggressive. Did you, when you went out, what was the reaction like from the public? I'm interested to know with that because you, you, you went to super fame. I mean, what, what yeah. happened? Did you not go out? I mean, was it difficult? Well, it was very difficult. Uh... I remember going to a birthday party at a restaurant in London and there was a crowd of people, uh, like four or five of my old friends who were talking. And I went up as I would do to join them. And there was like an atmosphere. I don't know if I'm paranoid or something, but they looked at me in a totally different way, like, oh, dear. Um, you know, they, 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 there was no humour or anything like that. It was like somebody had come up in a, with, with some disability or something like that. The, you know, the way they look, look at you in, in that. They pretend that they're not. But, and, and I just felt, I, I remember going, um, walking my, at the time, we, I had my son who was about a year old. Uh, and I was walking him in Hyde Park in the pram. And I was just had read an article in the Sunday Times because it wasn't only the tabloids and the, 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 the serious paper were always writing horrible things. Um, and I just said to myself, how the hell could this happen? How could my life be turned around like this um, over such a stupid thing? Um, so I didn't go out because every time I went out, I felt people were... Judging, looking at me, and I stayed in. I literally stayed in. And one day I was actually watching Countdown in bed at four o'clock in the afternoon when my wife came into my bedroom and said, you just can't go on like this. Um, you've got to get out. And, and she threatened to kick me out. And sometimes you need somebody like that to do that. Yeah. Um, I made the joke that, you know, it's funny that you're throwing me out because I'm always at home because my first wife actually threw me out because I was never at home. Um, but she uh, did me a favour, and that's when I started up the health club. Uh, sometimes you need somebody to give you a kick up the ass. Um, yeah. But it was seven years of not going out, of avoiding going out. But you know, today I went to a, did a speech the other day in Manchester, and somebody asked me the question: Do you regret saying what you said in 1991 at the Albert Hall? And I said, well, that is clearly the stupidest question anybody's ever asked me. Of course I regret it. I lost everything. But then he says, but you're much happier now than you were then. You haven't got all the pressures. Uh, people look up to you because you've come, made a comeback. You know, you lost it all and you've, you're now, um, you know, multimillionaire. And, and they, they feel that, you know, you've fought your way back. You, you make a great speech about it and make everybody laugh. Um, you wouldn't have had all that. And I said, do you know something? You could be right. 
it's the most ridiculous thing that I made the biggest mistake in corporate history. And here we are discussing whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. It was a bad thing in terms of a lot of the staff. Uh, there's no question about that. And it was a bad thing in terms of what I went through. But if nobody dies, you come out a bit stronger in a way. I think the sad thing of this story, really, is that you just summed it up. It was a personal attack on you by the media, but they didn't think about the consequences, especially in the recession. 27,000 people lost their jobs. And that's just not right. That should never be allowed to happen. That's just... Yeah, they didn't, they didn't all lose their jobs, but a lot of them lost their jobs. And a lot of them uh, didn't get any salary increases. And they, a lot of thousands of people suffered because of it. Uh, uh, and and the sun and the mirror apologised because everything they said was inaccurate, but they apologised on page 27 uh, with three lines and said that what we said was incorrect, that Gerald didn't say, didn't mention his jewellery, that it was crap, and that um, he didn't say that he has contempt for his customers, and he didn't say this and he didn't say that. But there was nobody ever read that. Not front page, is it? And they don't have it wasn't to. The front page. It wasn't the front page, and it wasn't only the front page. It was page three, page five, page seven. It went on and on. Yeah. And it, it, you know, you can take anything, but when it's just made up, it really does piss you off. And you could see that the damage it was doing to the to the to the business that I built. With me, I can take anything. For me person, I, I've developed what I call rhinoceros skin. And when it starts affecting my family. That's when it bothers me. I've got six kids, amazing wife. When it starts seeing the stress on them, that's the next question I was going to ask you. What impact did this have on your family? What? I mean, well, I, had to, I, I, had to, I had to sell my house, uh, take them out of school. Um, they loved the house. And uh, children are quite resilient, they were quite young. Um, but you know, they made they came back and said that some of their friends in class had made jokes about me and stuff like that, and it's all crap and all that stuff like that. And yeah, you're right, the worst you can take it all, but when it's a little girl who's eight years old and comes back, you know, upset about it, that really does hurt, that is really painful. And you know, and I had journalists climbing up the drain pipes of my house, peering through the windows, giving my son a shock of his life and stuff like that. Um, I mean, they really do behave in the most despicable way uh, towards you. There was always crowds outside. Um, and even my ex-wife was subject to it. And uh, it, it's just something that it, you, I don't wish anybody to go through because it is, is very unpleasant. But you're right, it's particularly upsetting when you're fat when you see your family suffer for it you're absolutely right about that i mean i can i can take it so no question so in today's time well it's it's not less or less let's just say 15 years ago you had the pr crisis management gurus out there who had the power to turn back stories and did you have an attempt at that i mean and, and also do you think in today's time if it happened today with social media, podcasts, you could have just slammed it shut. Do you think you could have avoided it and got your, your word out and things would be, it must have crossed your mind? Well, I had corporate PR who resigned at the time because they said that this has now gone from the city pages to the front pages uh, and the feature pages and we're not set up to deal with those journalists. So I then hired... I was advised to hire a crisis management PR company. They just dealt with the BP oil slick or something like that. Um, they were absolutely effing useless mm. uh, because the fact was that however much unpopular I'd become, I'd always dealt with the press and spoken to them and I was always available on the phone. They advised me not to speak to them and they spoke to them instead. And that really uh, alienated the press enormously. Uh, every bit of advice that they gave me of how to deal with it uh, made things worse. I mean, they put me on the Terry Wogan show, which then had about 15 million viewers at seven o'clock on BBC One. 
basically what that did was inform the 50% of the population that hadn't even heard the story. So they proliferated. If you make a mistake, don't broadcast it. So the, all the advice that they gave, which they were charging me a fortune for, was make, just making things worse and worse. But maybe they would have just got worse anyway, um, because the press loved this story. Um, it ticked all the boxes for them. Uh, it was somebody supposedly who was very rich making fun of poorer people, which is... Uh, people blame know. the recession, don't they? I, I don't buy that story. I say to my team in 2008, we're not taking part in the recession. We're a family brand. We can ride that out. We did. And I said it to them this time around. We have a recession again. We're just we're going to decide not to take part in it. We're going to strive forward. Don't read the news because that's it's the news and the media that has that impact to drive everything and scare people and stop them from spending and so on. So we just keep keep expanding, keep opening new sites, and we don't take part in the recession. But I don't think your business. I know so I've seen some journalists says, "Oh, the timing was wrong because of the because of the recession." I think you had a recession-proof business there, personally, with Ratners. Yeah, we were doing the right thing. We were offering good value, good products, and it's just all this rubbish about recession and boom. It's got nothing to do with it. If you go to a really good restaurant that serves great food, whether there's a recession or not, it's going to be packed. If you go to a restaurant that serves lousy food and lousy service, it's going to be empty during a boom. But what the, the trouble with these people that write about it know nothing about business. Business is to do with what you create what you achieve for your customers and if you do that successfully you would do well regardless of recession and boom if you do things badly there could be the greatest boom of all time and you're not going to make and then plenty of people didn't do well in the boom <laughs> i got 50 percent of the jewelry market people say well it's because of the because uh, the boom of the 80s but nobody else got 50% of the jewelry market. In fact, a lot of the jewellers did really badly because we hit them hard. So I think it's got a lot to do with what you can achieve rather than uh, things that people just use it as an excuse. You know, oh, God, you know, all you get now in the media is it's like a badge of honour to suffer, you know, to be doing badly, to blame everybody else. But where does that, where does that get you in life? I could spend my life blaming everybody else. I've never blamed the press. I've never blamed anybody else but myself. Uh, you know, I should never have uh, made the joke. Um, and I put my hands up. But I got on with my life. Uh, and I've got a great life now. And uh, I've learned a, a lot of lessons. And I don't... Uh, and when I do my after-dinner speeches all over the world... Um, it wouldn't be very good if I stood up and said, oh, well, I'm a victim of this and people really, you know, it's unfair, the press. And that. I, met, I, I joke about it. I'm, it's, I, I'm very lighthearted about it. And that's life. I once read a book and the first line of it was, life is difficult. If you accept that, it's no longer difficult. But people don't realise life is difficult and you have to deal with it. And it, it, you're a better person for uh, dealing with those challenges. Well, Michael told me once, he said, as long as you're loved when you're born into this world, when you leave this world, all the crap in between we can deal with. And that is so true. It really is. And uh, the thing of entrepreneurship and business people too, or anybody, any walk of life, there are going to be hard times. You have to accept it. I, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago at Rob Moore's event, Money Mindset in London, with... 100 entrepreneurs, I know you've been involved with them as well. Yeah. I, I said to Rob, I'm going to talk about my dark times because when I do talk about that, and this first came about on the Clubhouse app, app which exploded in lockdown one. When I talk about my dark times, they all engage. They all relate to me. Some a normal human being. Who's, they might be on antidepressants. They might be going for a divorce, having a hard time. So whenever I do a speech now, I talk about my hard times. And I get more interest in that girl than I do about the successful, crazy, five-star lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, multi-million lifestyle, they, they, they can relate to me. And afterwards, they come up to me and say, thanks for saying that. That's inspired me. I'm, I'm, I'm going through this. I'm having problems here. I'm having problems with my wife. And, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. And it's an interesting thing. Because I think entrepreneurs, they just show their, their Ferraris, their Lambos, their helicopters, the choppers. But they all have bad times in the background. They've all got personal problems. You've got money problems. You've either got no money or you've got too much money. It's still a problem. 
And um, yeah, for me, it hit home. As soon as, if you talk about your bad times, I think you've learned that massively. They are fully engaged, aren't they? They relate to you. They think, you know, the man behind Ratner's is a real person. He's one of us. And they listen and they take notes. And you change one person's life, it makes a massive difference. Yeah, I mean, there's so many similarities between us because I do exactly the same things, Bridge. And people come up to me and say, you really cheered me up. My bank foreclosed on me today. And, uh, you know, I can see that there is, if you can come back from where you did, then I can come back. And life isn't all about what you. everybody tries to make out, that they're all successful. I once saw a speech by John Caldwell who did slides of all his cars and houses and everybody hated it because in fairness he's a brilliantly successful businessman but he's never put a foot wrong but it's actually quite a boring speech um and they do like and the reason that i have been on the speaker circuit for 20 years and was voted one of the top 10 speakers is purely because my speech is littered with disasters and people find it much more engaging to hear about all the calamities uh, because that is the truth of life. Um, when you see an advert on TV about a, a couple in a lovely house with two lovely children for washing up liquid and the sun's coming through the window and everything's perfect, that is TV. That's not the reality. When you get to know people, everybody has skeletons in the cupboard. You know, everybody um, has to deal with problems uh nobody is normal they all have issues that we that they have to deal with but it's all we all pretend you know in the media or on tv that everything is wonderful and perfect uh the human being is very is a flawed is very flawed uh First entrepreneurs they do have a pain inside them to make them have that drive to go places in the first place and, and the reason why you do so well is because you're able to handle pressure and go through the hard times where the average business person will say, I, I can't handle this, can't handle the haters, and they'll turn back. Can't handle the headlines, and off they go. And I think with you, Joel, too, you, you're actually very proud of your achievements in your life. You don't look down on it at all. You build a multi-billion business. It's, to you, it's a success. You know, what happened was unfortunate, but you look back and you're super proud on it. And, and who knows? We don't know what we don't know. You, you know, you were, you were operating at a hell of a level back then. You might not be with us today because you, you could have just opened more and more and more and more and more, not focused on your health like you do now. So I know you very much on that. I don't know if you did back then. You know, everything happens for a reason and service, and I truly believe that. Yeah, uh, and, you know, there's always a silver lining. Uh, if you've got a fault, uh, if you've got problems, turn it into advice. I've just had this decorator come in. And he's been shouting, and I wonder who he's shouting to, and he's actually shouting to himself because he's got Tourette's. He's got this uh, autism, and he talks to himself. And he's doing, And then I asked him to put some pictures up on the wall. I always put pictures up on the wall, and they're always wonky, and they're not. He's put a load of these pictures, about 12 pictures along a wall, and I looked at it, and it's absolutely perfect. Each picture is exactly six inches away from the next one, all the way along. He hasn't deviated, not one picture slightly higher. Ones. They're all absolutely perfect. Because of his Tourette's, he, everything has to be absolutely spot on. He's the best decorator I've ever come across. Now, he wouldn't be if he didn't have this problem in life. Mm. Um, so, you know, we have to embrace our faults uh, and, you know, it, it, you know, somebody who, who is often got these problems has a great personality. Somebody who's absolutely perfect, uh, it can be very, very dull. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, don't, I can look myself in the mirror. I've made one big mistake in life. In fact, I've made quite a lot of mistakes, but they're never talked about because of the enormity of that one. <laughs> but I don't mind. I can look myself in the mirror. I haven't broken the law. I've always treated people well. Uh, I know I get compared on Twitter to some really nasty individuals who really have done those things, and that, you know, really does piss me off. Uh, but that's Twitter. That's what they are. I, they're very nice to me on LinkedIn. So Twitter is where the trolls live, Gerald. That's where the trolls live. Yeah, that's for sure. So where are you at today? So I know you're big into mentoring, public speaking. Got you got a book, which are you very passionate about helping entrepreneurs? 
learn from your mistake and your successes and you're very successful at that so what's your lifestyle like today what do you what's your goals for the future well I do now like uh, mentoring and I've got quite a few people that I'm, I'm mentoring and I help them um, with with their problems um, and even though I'm this poster boy for failure on Twitter, people seem to want to hear my advice. But I love I, I, no problem is to you. I like really mind. <laughs> I don't know, you ain't got a problem. Uh, no. And also, if you have had setbacks, it's actually, you know, you've improved because of it because you know how to, you won't make those mistakes again. Uh, I do a lot of speeches. I'm off to Edinburgh on Monday um, to do a speech at the Balmoral Hotel. Uh, then I've just come back from Dubai, where I did a speech uh, for people who didn't even know who I was, but they could still identify with the whole story. Um, and it's very cathartic uh, because whenever I get, I do these uh, sp speeches and talks, I get nothing but warmth from the audience. Mm. Nothing but people coming up saying the nicest things, patting me on the back. Uh, when people get hear the truth and meet me face to face, they are surprised that I'm a totally different animal from the person that is perceived uh, in the press. Uh, so I, I particularly, you know, spend a lot of time doing that. I'm involved with various different businesses, in, for even in jewellery. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was doing a speech with, uh, sorry, mentoring with Rob in the uh, Cayman Islands, it was our day off. We weren't doing any mentoring on the Sunday. We had a day off. What did I do? These young girls that I was mentoring, at, you know, 25, 30, they sat on the beach. I flew to Dallas, Fort Worth in America to do a speech there and to come back on United Airlines at three o'clock in the morning, so I'd be back in time for the mentoring. I'm 70, 72, uh, and I love it. I love working, I love being active, I love using my brain as well as doing, using my body in terms of exercise. The worst thing you can be is to just do nothing, which I did for seven years uh, when I gave up and I was told that I was unemployable and used to lie in bed watching Countdown. They were the worst years, and I learned from those years that if you want to lie around wallowing in your own grief, uh, things will only get worse. So I, the more active I am, whether it's physically or mentally, exercising my brain, exercising my body, the happier I am. So I want to keep doing that uh, till the age of 100, if possible. That's the key. My grandparents both lived in 97 and they really strongly believe the exercise was important. Also, they would do jigsaws and puzzles to keep their mind active. Okay. And um, yeah, and, and they, they, they yeah. lived an old age. Last question. So if this speech didn't happen and the media didn't take it the way they did, where would you be now, do you think? I think I'd probably be still running the uh, Ratner's group. There's no reason why I wouldn't be running it. Uh, and and it's, it's still going. I mean, all the Ratner shops closed, true. Uh, and, and the UK division has been scaled down massively. But America has done extremely well. I mean, we built a fantastic business in America, which the new management has grown. It's now a three billion pound business. Everybody thinks Ratner's has gone bust. It's not. It's just renamed Signet. It's still going. It's a three billion pound uh, company. So I'd be running a three billion pound company. In fact, if I was running, maybe it'd be five billion. Who knows? Because the UK wouldn't have uh, suffered in the way it did. Uh, but would I be happier doing exactly the same thing for all those years, from the age of fifteen to the age of seventy in your seventies? No, I think that's a mistake to be sitting in that office, doing looking at those same shops. You know, because what? I've now got is a much more varied lifestyle where I can do my exercise, my cycling, I can do the walking. I meet people like you, which I wouldn't have done, uh, and people that I've, you know, just in, in, in this world that I've, I've had much 
you know, I, I've had much more time for people. Uh, when I was running that company, I was a bit self-obsessed with, with, with what I, about me. Now I'm more interested in other people. So, yeah, I probably would still be running that business, but I wouldn't be uh, as happy as I am today. I know I don't look happy. That's my face. I can't help it, but I am happy at these days. Would you be as healthy as what you are now, do you think? I certainly would not be healthy. I'd have a big, fat stomach. Yeah. And I'd be smoking cigars and uh, drinking. And uh, as you said earlier, especially as you get older, because I have one or two friends who have been ill, unfortunately, one who's had a stroke and stuff like that, perhaps drank too much. It, you know, your health, you can't buy your health. And to feel good in the morning, to wake up and to actually feel good is what it's all about. However much money you've got, you know, to breathe, you know, fresh air to feel really good and healthy, even at my age. And that is the most important thing. So, Joel, your message to the public at the minute as a, as a person who's been through hell and back and seen recessions and pandemics and everything you can imagine, and you know some government figures and you've met royalty, you, you know how the world works. So energy bills crisis, and we can't ignore that. Apparently, monkeypox and all the other stuff, COVID. Entrepreneurs, what would you say to them? What's your biggest advice you would give to them now when they are concerned about this stuff? I mean, I kind of know how it works, but I'd like to have your take on it. Well, I think you've got to uh, ignore all this noise, all this negativity that is coming out. And let, let your competitors look at this negativity and say, oh, well, this is not the time for making money. This is not the time for building businesses because we've got double-digit inflation and we're going into recession and uh, everybody's losing. I'll just hold on to what I've got. That ain't the way to do it. The way to do it is to risk everything. Business, entrepreneurs, is about risk. I took huge risks. I was doing very well in the UK and I went to America and I knew if I failed there, that my investors would turn on me with venom. But I did it, and I got a great kick from taking risks. And so regardless of how bad this climate is, I'm not saying it isn't, it is diabolical. Um, huge fortunes have been made in recessions, even in wartime. So, you know, go for it, take a risk. There is nothing more exciting than gambling, taking a risk. Okay, you've got to have confidence in yourself that you're going to succeed. It's no good backing some horse and relying on that to win. You're backing yourself. And if you feel that you're going to win that race because you know that you've got confidence in yourself, general economic climate and Rishi Shunak and all that rubbish is nothing to do with you. That's just an excuse. It's yeah, irrelevant. All cycles, all cycles too, doesn't it, Joe? Everything cycles. Yeah. I was on Nigel Farage's show recently, talking points of GB News. I gave him quite a hard time because I, I really believe the government should be ran by business people. How the heck are they qualified with their degrees and stuff to manage our money, our tax money, which we pay an awful lot of tax, and invest in the right places? They haven't got a clue. You need uh, Richard Branson in there or someone like that who... Who knows what they're doing? Now, I was a big, big fan of Trump because what he's achieved in his life, he knows how to operate a business. An economy is a business. So what's, what's your take on that? I think Trump was a brilliant, uh, I know it sounds uh, very unfashionable to say, so but I think he was a brilliant uh, president because he had a business brain and he made a lot of brilliant decisions. He might have said some stupid things, but, you know, that's Americans tend to do that. Um, I think that, the national health is a effing disaster because it's run by people who are not business people who just throw money out the window. I think out of the 110 billion budget, 60 billion is paid out in to lawyers and in compensation for bad operations and stuff like that. They waste money. They spend too much money. Uh, it's a crying shame because I'm a great fan of, of the concept, but it's run into the ground, um, as is a lot of the public sectors these days. The establishment 
has let us down. Uh, the politicians has let us down. And the waste, uh, the, the, because it's not their money. It's other people's money. It's your money. It's my money. Now, when you're spending other people's money, um, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll buy, I don't care. I'll just throw it around. They just throw money around like it's confetti. Mm. And uh, there is no, that, that's why I agree with you that you need a business brain to be involved in politics because they're running the biggest businesses in the country. And yet they're totally not qualified to do so. There's no, Nigel said there's not one person on the cabinet who's had, even had a paper out. <laughs> so. yeah. I mean, it's just, and then they're responsible for budgets, million, billion pound budgets. Yeah. And they're spending it and they're spending, you know, the, our, the taxpayers' money just going out the window. And, you know, I mean, we've got a situation now with pensions where, uh, for instance, the police would retire at 55 at their peak. You wonder why the police are not performing because they're all retiring at 55 on full pension. And then they're living till they're sort of 90. Some of the women are living till they're 95. So, in fact, they're drawing pension longer than they're actually drawing a salary. That's not where the pension that's all pension used to be something that you've got when you were you know for the last 10 years of your life when you couldn't work because you had arthritis and stuff like that but now it's just the government have just you know, turned it into a gravy train for teachers police uh doctors all that sort of stuff that they can sit around uh getting these huge salaries for doing nothing it's a ridiculous uh, situation this is i mean awesome. i've got to work i've got to work to keep a roof on my head as you do yeah Okay. It's a shame they penalise the people who really take the risk, give up their life almost, like, like me and you did, and we pay the most tax, and yet the people who just don't want to get off their bum and sit at home all day, have got no interest to just play the benefit game. And I know there's many out there who obviously are genuine in that situation, stuck in those ruts, but I just think entrepreneurs should be given a bit of a tax break because all my friends are just leaving the country. They're going to Cyprus and Dubai and and just I don't think the government realised. Well, Nigel Farage he said they got no connection with entrepreneurs whatsoever. That's what he said to me. They don't even look on us as anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, now Nigel actually asked me to go on his show, and I'm I'm going to do it now after hearing what you've said yeah. uh, again, probably through Rob Moore uh, who introduced because he did a podcast with uh, Nigel Farage. I, I, um, I introduced him to Nigel. Nigel's a great guy, and again, he's. His uh, image is messed around with. He's, he's a lovely man, and yeah, and uh, yeah, I think you're going very well with him. You've got very similar stories too. Yeah, very much. Well, on that note, Gerald, how do people contact you, or do you want people contacting you? How do they contact? Yeah, you? yeah. I mean, they can uh, if you just go on LinkedIn. Uh, all my details are there. My phone number, email, anything like that. I'm on Twitter, even though I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, Facebook. Uh, Instagram the lot so I'm, I'm the easiest person to contact okay. you know I don't believe in all these things of putting secretaries and everybody in the way uh, I learned that in America if you phone up the president of a big company in America you get straight through to them uh, so I'm totally accessible that's been your whole crib and that's what I've learned so you're personal and I expect any staff around us could have got you on the phone if the message was left in the right place you would have called them back always yeah Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. It's very interesting, the parallels in our... In very our, similar. Very similar, yeah. And I'm glad I've learned them early on. Well, you, mind you, I'm 43, so you you went through this. When, how old were you when you went through this? About 43. You thought it was isn't it? Exactly the same, 1991. So there you go. Or was that 41? Might have been 41. I was about your age anyway. Uh, so there you go. So anyway, I hope that you. Really needs to be made into a film. Would be better than Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, definitely. Well, this podcast is is. I can honestly say I've done about thirty or forty podcasts, and this one bears no resemblance to any of the others. It's totally different. So it's worth a. It's. Uh, I've enjoyed doing it with you. I appreciate that, Joe.